More and more people are pulling the plug on their cable TV connection in favor of Netflix, Apple TV, and Amazon Prime for more control on when as well as what they will watch. And this new wave of TV use offers exposure to more news channels than the customary major networks, which used to command the attention of a major portion of the viewing population. There are now many choices to seek out for the news junkie, from Al Jazeera to RT, which often report in-depth news not covered by the usual media outlets, known as mainstream media. Of particular interest are the alternate news services in North America, open media in Canada and popular resistance in the U.S., which do more than just report the news as citizen journalists. Our first report is focused on popular resistance, and we have with us the co-founder and editor, Dr. Margaret Flowers, a pediatrician of 15 years who became disillusioned with the realities of medical politics and decided to change her focus. Hi, Dr. Flowers. Uh, what can you tell us about popularresistance.org? Um, we see Popular Resistance as a website that covers the movement that's not being covered. Um, as you said, we do uh, post articles from some progressive outlets, but we also have a lot of activists that send us information, reports, videos, photos of the actions that they're working on. We think it's important that people are aware that there is a lot of resistance going on, as well as working to create new systems. We follow kind of a two-path approach of we need to resist the harmful policies and at the same time build up positive alternatives that can replace the systems that we have right now. Um, so in addition to covering kind of the resistance news, we also hope to show that the struggles that we're engaged in are all really connected. We're all really part of one uh, broader struggle and for social, economic, racial, environmental justice, uh, basically is what it boils down to. Um, and so we choose campaigns that fit within that strategy, that help to unite the movement, or things that we just see as really critical. Of particular importance at this time is the drafting in secret of a major trade deal between the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and other nations that will solely benefit the major U.S. corporations who are privy to these negotiations. The ramifications of what we know from leaked documents is truly frightening. Great. Yeah, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a campaign that we've been working on. It actually predates popular resistance. Popular resistance is about two years old. It came out of our work in the Occupy movement in the United States. Um, but we've been working on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, fighting that since 2012. And one of the reasons that we picked that up as a major campaign is that it, it really impacts everything that we care about, the food that we eat, having clean water, clean air, you know, the climate crisis, jobs and wages, healthcare, education. Um, it, it has an impact on all of those, so it's an opportunity to bring people who are fighting for all these issues together. But it's also uh, such a type of an agreement together with the others that we're facing in the United States. The, um, I know you have CETA with the European Union. We have the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership and the Trade and Services Agreement. These taken together will fundamentally alter the global power structure in ways that prevent us from protecting our communities and from protecting the planet and will really move all of our work back that we've tried to make in social progress back decades and make it very difficult to proceed. So um, I'm glad that you invited me on to talk about this today. It's an important topic. Yeah, I mean, at a time when it's really critical that we build our local economies for a number of reasons, the, the climate crisis being one of them, um, but also we need to end these extractive economies that take money out of our communities and, and take them to a corporate head, headquarters somewhere else. We need to, to build up our own communities. Um, some of the early texts of the Trans-Pacific Partnership that were leaked, because this is a classified document, they're negotiating it pretty much in secret, so we know what we're learning from, from leaks, is that they really want to do away with what they call state-owned enterprises, um, anything that gets any advantage from the state, um, whether it's preferential purchasing or tax credits or access to cap capital or anything like that. So our, our attempts to, you know, buy things locally and provide for ourselves locally, um, that's seen as an unfair trade advantage. I'm sorry, it's been a long day. Um, 
that is seen as an unfair trade advantage to um, these foreign corporations. And so they have to be given access to those, you know, quote unquote markets. So the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership has been negotiated um, pretty much in earnest since President Obama picked it up in 2009. Um, and negotiations had broken down earlier this year because as they were nearing the final negotiations, uh, it really was clear that in order to pass the TPP through in the United States, our government needed to give President Obama something called Fast Track Trade Promotion Authority, where he could sign the agreement before it goes to Congress. And then they have a very limited time to look at it. They can't change it. They can only vote up or down. And so there was a big fight here to stop Congress from giving President Obama Fast Track. And we lost that in July. But prior to that, you know, during that fight, the negotiations for the Trans-Pacific Partnership had basically stopped. And so August, this, or I guess just it was the end of July, um, just a week or so ago, they finally picked those negotiations back up in Hawaii. And we were very nervous because um, we know that they're trying to rush this through here in the U.S. before the end of this year. Um, and now that, you know, we knew that now that they have fast track, uh, the real, you know, tough negotiations would begin. Uh, fortunately, what came out of that was that there's a lot of division uh, around the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They weren't able to make the headway that they were hoping to make. They weren't able to complete the agreement. There are a number of outstanding issues uh, from agricultural issues, dairy in Canada, rice in Japan, um, the issues of automotives, uh, pharmaceuticals, as you mentioned earlier. Um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership would give a huge uh, extension of patent rights to pharmaceutical corporations so and provide more barriers for creating generics. Um, so a lot of tension over that, tension over what's called the ISDS or Investor State Dispute Settlement chapters, which uh, would basically, as you were describing before, allow corporations to sue our governments if our um, laws to protect our communities interfere with their profits. You reported in your newsletter of recent demonstration in Hawaii where delegates of the TPP were meeting to wrap up what they thought would be the final meeting to approve the partnership agreement between the 12 countries involved, including Canada. They were having the negotiations in Hawaii. Um, of course, that's a long way for most of us to travel, so we reached out to our uh, allies in Hawaii, and they were able to very quickly come up with a creative protest. We were trying to think of how can we disrupt what's going on in this hotel where they're negotiating, which is fairly protected and remote and, and um, difficult to get access to. So they had this idea of applying to the Guinness Book of World Records to have the largest number of people blowing conch shells at the same time. And that was an exciting enough event that they were able to attract they are still working on the final number, but I think close to 400 people that came out to blow conch shells outside the hotel. Great. So it is possible to have fun while still making an important statement of your beliefs. I know from your website and weekly newsletters that you are involved in several other contentious issues, one of which was the recent attempt by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, to regulate the Internet. Had this gone through, it would have affected every citizen of every country, just as the TPP is threatened to do. The campaign that we've been involved in quite a bit over the past year is the net neutrality fight. I don't know if you followed that up in Canada. We actually had some allies in Canada. Open Media was helping us with that. Um, but the, our government was trying to further uh, deregulate the Internet here so that... Um, it could become really more of a tiered internet, more like cable TV where people would only have access to uh, what they can pay for. So you would have different packages and maybe you would get certain services in one package and certain in the other. And we knew that um, at, if that started to happen, the internet is really our tool for movement building, for media, for citizens media that's growing. It's essential for us for spreading information um, and for organizing. And so if we started to lose that access, we knew that it would really um, harm our ability to move forward. So we uh, had a campaign that was successful 
actually. And in a one year period, we were able to get the internet reclassified as a common carrier or like a, a utility, like electricity that comes to our house or water that comes to our house. So now we're having to defend that um, to keep the Congress from undermining undermining that. But that was very exciting. Um, using a combination of kind of traditional tools of, you know, phone calls, emails, letters, um, but also some direct action um, confronting the head of the Federal Communications Commission directly. At one point, we were occupying outside of the FCC building for about a week and had a lot of people set up their tents out there which they weren't quite used to. At another point, we blockaded the chairman's driveway and prevented him from going to work. We told him he was working for the cable companies and not the people, and we weren't going to let him continue to do that. Um, so it was, an, it was an interesting campaign. Uh, we even at one point did a three-part musical in front of the Federal Communications Commission uh, telling the story the way we wanted it to turn out if the chairman would side with the people instead of with the giant telecoms. Okay, thanks. Well, that's all the time we have for this interview. Thank you, Margaret, for taking the time, and we look forward to hearing about your campaigns. And thank you for watching.